Uh, this is about AI hype. I have spent a lot of time thinking about AI hype for some two years now. And as the hype gets more and more intense, so the problems facing the creators of the new AI systems become greater and greater. I'm just going to address one or two small problems. There are many much bigger problems. In the same week that ChatGPT was released, I published this book with a German AI expert collaborator of mine. The book contains arguments why something like ChatGPT would not work. We don't talk about ChatGPT, of course, but we do talk about GPT-3, and the same arguments apply, and the, our, the proof that we presented is now coming to realization since ChatGPT or the large language model community are beginning to suffer a severe setback. They have reached the point where scaling, which means adding more and more data, does not work. For a long time, people have indeed believed that the way to build artificial general intelligence is to just collect more and more training data. The more training data you have, the more intelligent your machine will be. Of course, they're none of them intelligent in any sense. They're just pieces of mathematics. And so this looked to be working with the initial uh, versions of GPT that the um, accuracy rate went up and the response rate, the range of responses went up. But then it started to plateau with GPT Turbo, which no one remembers. And then the question is, what's going to happen next? And there is a rumor which started about three days ago that they have in fact reached a ceiling. They added a lot more data at OpenAI to the GPT process and the quality and the error rate went down. This is a shock wave, which is really worrying given that they have raised all of these billions of dollars and are using all of this energy to what they assumed would be a successful program. Now, why is this happening? One reason is what they call enshittification. The, the, the problem is that they've used up all the good data trawling through the internet. They have also accumulated, of course, a lot of bad data because I am told that there are falsehoods in the internet. But now they're using data which they themselves have created. And we know that if you create your own data, using your own system in order to train your system in the next stage, then the data gradually starts to get corrupted. It's called autophagy. So an example of this corruption is here. So this is an, an illustration from a peer review journal. It got through peer review, even though this, this image is quite clearly nonsense. Even the wording, if you look at the letters in the words, They've not been checked by a human being. And Christoph is quite right to complain about the fact that we are now living in a world where nonsense created by nonsense is being read by nonsense systems. In order to have a successful AI system, and there are, of course, many really good successful AI models out there, you need representative data. That is to say, data which represents the target domain so that you can use the patterns in the data to predict the behavior of the target domain. You can only get representative data from simple systems like the solar system. You can't get representative data from complex systems and all organisms are complex systems. AI works very well for simple systems. It works for all artifacts. It works for chess for instance, off a of go, because they're like artifacts. They can be modeled mathematically. But complex systems resist modeling. So examples of complex systems are the weather system, the climate system. That's why all climate models fail. It's a complex system. All organic systems are complex systems. All hybrid systems, which involve organisms alongside physical machines, for instance, such as the New York Stock Exchange or the Budapest subway system or the, the Chernobyl nuclear power station in its regular use before it was wrecked by some of its uh, staff, all of these systems are predictable. The Chernobyl nuclear power station in its regular operation was predictable. It was a simple system, but it was a very complicated system. 
the regular activities of which were disrupted by adjustments made by human beings. And then it immediately became a complex system so that its behavior couldn't be predicted. Now, the reason why the behavior of complex systems can't be predicted is because they are subject to a process of evolution. Families grow larger. They have new babies. They grow older. They become drug addicts and so forth, or AI experts. And for all of these reasons and other reasons which we document in our book at great length, there is no way to collect representative data from systems like this because they have no distribution. They do not have the kind of statistical patterns that can support prediction. Now, they do have some simple patterns. For instance, we wake and then we sleep and then we wake and then we sleep. We can predict that if we're awake, we will at some stage be asleep. That is a simple system dimension of a complex system called a human being. But you can't make synoptic predictions relating to complex behaviors on the part of complex systems like human beings because they have no distribution. All right, so as I say, there are many great successes of what they call narrow AI, but there we can always enable good predictions of the behavior. That's how we managed to solve the game of Go, for instance. ChatGPT creates good predictions sometimes, but it also, as we know, creates bad predictions. And here by prediction, we just mean the creation of the response to the prompt. That, in mathematical terms, is called a prediction. ChatGPT and its successors make good predictions for those domains where they have really good uh, and large amounts of data, for instance, about Taylor Swift. But they don't work for conversations. And that's because every conversation is unique. And that's why after 50 years, we'd still have no effective chatbot. So if you call your bank and you're put through to a computer, you immediately panic and you want to be put through to a human being because conversations are complex systems and we cannot predict the next move in a complex system like a conversation using the mathematics that is available to us if we want to compute, namely church Turing mathematics. So consider the problem of starting a conversation. These two blokes are sitting around drinking, getting bored. Maybe one of them is reading his email. But one of them says, I know this is not really a very believable scenario, but still, one of them says, play chess. And they start talking about whether they will play chess. Computers can't do that. Only humans can start a conversation. Now, of course, humans can program a computer to reach out to the nearest human being and start a conversation every 193 minutes or something. But that's not starting a conversation. That's just emitting certain noises which may or may not succeed in starting a conversation. Now, similarly, computers can't start a game of chess. It has to be a human being either doing the starting switching on the computer and uh, uploading the chess software or by using the computer that is already ready to play chess because that's the only thing which the computer does. Now, the reason why computers can't start a conversation or want to rule the world is that they lack the feature we call will. They can't want anything. They don't give a damn. They only want the things that we tell them to want, which means that we do the wanting. And this also means that computers can't behave ethically or unethically. There is no such thing as AI ethics. Now, we're trying to define human intelligence, or at least that's the title of the talk. In every conversation, humans prove that they have an ability to respond spontaneously to complex phenomena. So this is something computers can't do. We do it all the time. The reason we can do it is because we have a will. We always want to achieve something. This is why human conversations are typically successful. In other words, people play along, that they sometimes get into fights, but in each case, the conversation is carried along in its existence through the fact that people want to achieve something, even if it's only the end of the conversation. And this is the definition of human intelligence, which was formulated actually by Max Scheler, 
who anticipated very many of the things that we uh, we need to know if we want to understand intelligence. So it's the ability to cope spontaneously and effectively with ever new environments, whether they are simple or complex, and to do this with any, without any sort of training or trial and error. Computers can never have intelligence in this sense, human intelligence. Now, in 2020, Elon predicted that AI will overtake humans in less than five years. Gary Marcus, who we, we met already because he has this slide relating to enshittification, he is in fact a wonderful critic of AI hype on an almost daily basis. So in 2024, he offered Musk a $1 million bet that artificial general intelligence, that is intelligence at the level of the human, will not arrive by the end of 2025, which was Musk's prediction. And Musk didn't take the bet. But the interesting thing is that some of the tasks which Marcus suggested could be used to gauge whether large language models like ChatGPT had reached the level of artificial and general intelligence by the end of 2025 are very interesting. So these are all intellectual activities. You can't do them unless you have human intelligence. You also need, of course, to have practical competence. You need to be able to move around a house and, and, so, and to hold a baby and so forth. But these are tasks which, if we had a computer with equal intelligence to the intelligence of a human, these are tasks which the computer could perform or should be able to perform. But then they would have to have what we call know-how or expertise. Some of our expertise we inherit. So we, we were born with the disposition to acquire a language. But then we have to acquire a specific language and that has to be learned. So we have inherited and we have learned expertise. This is a biological phenomenon, which goes back 8 million years when we first started to grunt in order to express ourselves in a way which gradually became language. This is an incredibly complicated ability. Now, when we need to acquire expertise, we often do this by listening to people who tell us how to do the relevant job. For instance, speak English. They use propositions, they use rules, in order to teach us how to speak English. But then gradually, we don't need those rules anymore. Gradually, we acquire expertise, which means the ability, the know-how to perform complicated tasks without using explicit rules. And we have this when we drive a car, we have this when we argue, we have this when we play chess even. Human beings are full of this acquired expertise. We have it when we console grieving widows. And now Melo Ponti points out that the cognitive and physiological aspects of our activity are fused together. All our behavior patterns involve an intellectual and a, a physiological component. And the, the intellectual and the physiological behavior patterns are, he says, part of our very flesh. So these are more examples of intellectual tasks which machines can't do. And of course, in order to take over the world, they would need to do things like commanding infantry battalions. Now, Polanyi, you all know, wrote two books on personal knowledge and on tacit knowledge. He applied these ideas about expertise to science. So we think of science as a rational enterprise, which is, in Polanyi's view, not rational at all. It's muscular, it's half subconscious practice comparable to the activities of the skilled craftsman. You can't do science according to a formula. You can't have a rule for doing science. The way you do science involves at every stage judgment and intuition. Now, of course, we won't need Polanyi and we won't need muscular, rigorous scientists because all science will be performed by artificial general intelligence, they say. If you look at the uh, literature on AI in the last two years, there are about 100,000 papers on archive. That means they've not been peer reviewed, but none of them address this problem of practical intelligence. They haven't realized that they're living in a world where we have to use our intellect to do things, important things.
But that's not a problem because very soon every university in the world will have its own AI building. In fact, several AI buildings.